Hello and welcome to today's edition of Great Western. And we have a book review for you today. We are reviewing Jennifer O'Leary's book, Le Padre, which has just been released. And this is essentially a biography of the famous or infamous Father Patrick Ryan, who was several things. He was the link or the main link between the IRA and Colonel Gaddafi's regime in Libya. And he was also um, an engineer who applied his skills to improve the IRA's bomb making. Quite a character. Jennifer O'Leary um, is the BBC Northern Ireland Spotlight journalist and she's done several uh, excellent documentaries on the Troubles. This book is a good book and if you have any interest in the Troubles in Northern Ireland then I definitely recommend it. It's essentially a biography. There are sections where uh, some rather flowery language is used in describing certain scenes, setting certain scenes. Um, it's not fiction. Um, I'm not really sure why this was done. And could anybody honestly say, hand on heart, how the light was falling through the windows on a certain occasion? I'm not sure that um, she knows for sure. And I'm not sure that Father Patrick Ryan knows for sure or probably took much notice. But putting that to one side, um, the amount of research here is astonishing. And this is because uh, Jennifer O'Leary spent many hours interviewing Father Patrick Ryan himself. And that's what I mean by saying it is essentially a biography of Patrick Ryan. So, as you'd expect, it covers his life in a lot of detail. Now, you might be thinking, what is it about this man that drove him to help um, a terrorist organisation? Well, the first thing to say is that he came from a fairly large, fairly typical Catholic family in County Tipperary. And his Republican sympathies seemed to come down mainly from his mother. And at this point, O'Leary is absolutely excellent. Uh, she describes his mother's uh, time as a girl during the Irish War of Independence, listening out for the hated uh, black and tans as they patrolled her village. And so by acting as a lookout, she'd be able to warn the men of the village um, to get out of sight and get away from the black and tans, which were essentially um, a type of police slash security forces which were deployed during the Irish War of Independence. And I think this explains where his motivation came from or where his sympathies came from. O'Leary is also good at showing how those sympathies were kind of below the surface for several decades. And then they arose with a passion in 1969, 1970, when that sad period known as the Troubles begins in Northern Ireland. He is the only child to go into the priesthood, but the book is good at explaining how that was a real big deal in Irish society and uh, a source of pride for the family. We don't hear too much about his theological or pastoral training to be a priest, and I must admit myself, that isn't something that I have a hugely detailed knowledge about. But we find that uh, once he has uh, completed his training and joined uh, his chosen holy order, that he's pretty soon out on the mission field uh, in Africa, Tanganyika, I believe it was called, where he does all sorts of uh, incredible things to uh, help spread the Catholic message. The most notable of which is learning how to fly and uh, providing the, the diocese or the mission group with an aircraft to use, which uh, he found massively increased the humanitarian and, and I suppose the spiritual reach of um, the mission that he was attached to. Now it seems that uh, 
um, a meddling, interfering bishop put paid to his dreams of staying in Africa. And strangely, he then finds himself as a curate or associate curate, so basically a junior priest, um, at a church in southeast London. This is, uh, to my knowledge, the only time he ever really spent in England. And the thing that comes across really clearly from O'Leary's book is that he hates it. He just seems to find it so boring. And as I hope to explain shortly, I think there's something about his dislike of that sort of work that has perhaps been overlooked. As if there's a key there to perhaps understanding Patrick Ryan. And it's in this area that I feel that the book somehow lacks some analysis of some of these questions. Because when you look at the cover of the book, um, which is on screen with me right now, we can very much see that that religious line is front and centre. We see the, the crucifix, the word padre, of course, which means father, and the true story of the Irish priest who armed the IRA with Gaddafi's money. And in fairness, all of that story is documented in a biographical fashion. But what I wanted were more answers. So we understand his historical motivations for being a Republican. It isn't entirely clear from the book why Father Ryan goes from holding those views, which admittedly in Ireland are peace-loving people can hold, to then holding strongly militant, violent Republican views. It's not really explained which uh, perceived injustice against the nationalist population of Northern Ireland pushed him in that direction. So we find in the book, in the early 1970s, um, that Patrick Ryan uh, leaves the work in uh, East London and begins living in different European cities. And he eventually settles in Spain. At the start of this process, he makes himself known to the IRA uh, while he is uh, staying in Ireland. He says that he won't join the IRA. He's absolutely clear about that. And he says that he will terminate his services at any time that he chooses. But he wants it to be known that he is on their side and he is there to help. The story then moves on to describe how various arms shipments from Libya were arranged and how Patrick Ryan became a key man who sometimes even met Colonel Gaddafi the Libyan leader at the time. Um, and there's some interesting stories here and some interesting anecdotes. We learn that some of these shipments are intercepted by um, the Irish security forces. So sometimes the plans to arm the IRA with modern equipment are thwarted. Curiously, the Libyans themselves sometimes under deliver on their promises and several of the shipments were far smaller than the IRA had been led to expect. Again, Patrick Ryan was the key link um, in, in these um, arrangements. The book um, documents something that perhaps Patrick Ryan is most famous or infamous for, and that is how he took uh, an innocent uh, parking timer this is the days before iPhones and things when you could set an alarm uh, and where somebody could use these things. They were called memo parks and they could dial up a time for the parking meter that they had parked at in a town or a city and then it would alert them to when they, uh, their parking was about to run out and they needed to go and feed the meter. Um, he bought an entire shopload of these memo park timers in Switzerland and he went away to uh, wherever he was staying at the time and incredibly he worked out how they could be used to time bombs to detonate and he actually invented a system to make that happen. This gave the IRA the ability to plant bombs more safely 
because it enabled them to reliably get away from a bomb and yet have a very accurate idea of when it would explode. Famously, this uh, technique using the Memo Park timer was in the bomb that uh, blew up the Grand Hotel in Brighton in October 1984, uh, killing four people, I believe, at the Conservative Party conference in a failed attempt to assassinate the then UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. We leave Patrick Ryan's story uh, towards the end of the 1980s. Um, he's no longer really well connected in Libya and he also falls out with the leadership of the IRA and he documents uh, an incident that takes place in uh, Dublin where he met Martin McGuinness and one of McGuinness's associates and they basically said it's time to move on you know do this thing that we want to do or you move on and Patrick Ryan chose to move on he is still alive today at the time of recording as far as I know and he's in his 90s and he lives in County Dublin so when he was interviewed as part of this research for a segment that went into uh, a BBC Northern Ireland Spotlight documentary, he said something which I found personally chilling. When O'Leary asked him, does he have any regrets? And to hear this 90 year old man with a big hat pulled over his head, stooped over sitting on a bench, to hear him say, my only regret is that I wasn't more effective. And by that he means more effective in the design and procurement of bombs for the IRA. That their campaigns weren't more effective. You sense that when O'Leary asked this question that she's kind of angling for something. A little morsel. A little sense perhaps of, you know, do you regret the loss of life? Do you regret the apparent dichotomy of your life as a man of God, but also enabling terrorists to operate more effectively? And incredibly, they say that people sometimes get softer as they get older, but incredibly there is no remorse from Patrick Ryan. He was kicked out of the Catholic Church, uh, not in a high profile way, he was more sort of let go subtly. This is um, explored towards the end of the book. And the final chapter of the book uh, is, I recall, um, A Very Evil Man. And I eagerly went to this chapter expecting perhaps the analysis that I've been seeking throughout this book. And sadly, although it is a very good book, I, I didn't get that analysis. What I was really looking for in this book is to try and see this dichotomy explained, examined. You know, how could somebody uh, who is a professing Christian uh, enable a terrorist organization to make better bombs and to give them more armament? How could somebody who you would think would understand the nature of forgiveness and perhaps taking a softer approach um, still in his 90s show no regret for his actions. The book also doesn't say a huge amount about the Catholic Church's response to Patrick Ryan. Um, certainly some senior Catholics in Ireland condemned him, but it's that lack of exploration there. I don't know if Jennifer O'Leary asked Patrick Ryan these questions and he refused to answer. I suppose that's something that you're not going to put in a book, but it is very strange. So The Padre is a competent biography of the life of Father Patrick Ryan. I don't think anything better will be produced in his lifetime. It's a good level of research, but I do wish that those hard spiritual theological themes could have been explored. Why was the work of a regular priest, a curate, so 
boring to him. Why did he lead on uh, a female member of the congregation to facilitate um, some of his uh, dealings uh, with Libya and uh, other, other people? Why did he do that? Did he not feel any conflict within himself between his professed faith and the teachings of Christ? These things are a mystery. And even if Patrick Ryan wasn't willing to give answers, it would have been nice for O'Leary to have branched out and given her own thoughts on uh, this issue. So I do feel that the Padre, whilst, you know, I'm sure a superlative piece of research, the best biography I think there could probably ever be on Father Ryan from his own mouth. I just feel that there is a missed opportunity there. Thanks for watching.